Good morning. I'm reading from Psalm 47. It says, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. Oh God, we, we turn to you this morning recognizing and confessing that you are King. We know that you are king of all the nations and we come before you this morning too because we've made confessions that say that you are not only our savior but that you are our Lord. And we ask that you would reign in our hearts. We need you to, to help us to follow you too. So we cry out to you. God, I pray for all the people who are joining in online this morning. That may our hearts be led by you and turn to you to praise you. You are our king. Amen. Oh, worship the King, oh, glory is above, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might. Sing of His grace, His robe is a light and canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds fall. Dark is His path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless King. To You alone be Your Majesty. Glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. Oh, measureless might, ineffable love, will angels delight to worship above? Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, a maker, defender, redeemer. King, to you alone be your majesty. Your glories and wonders one tongue can recite. You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. You alone are the matchless king. And wonders when some can recite Breathe in the air Shine in the light Lo, worship the King All glory is above Lo, gratefully sing His wonderful love Our shield and defender The ancient of days Pavilion in splendor And girded with praise You thought of us before the world began to breathe You knew our names before we came to be You saw the very day we'd fall away from you How desperately we need to be redeemed Lord Jesus Come lead us We're desperate for your touch Oh great and mighty one With one desire we come That you would reign That you would reign in us 
We're offering up our lives A living sacrifice That you would reign That you would reign in us Spirit of the living God Fall fresh again Come search your hearts and purify our lives We need your perfect love, we need your discipline We're lost unless you guide us with your light Lord Jesus, come lead us we're desperate for your touch Oh great and mighty one With one desire we come That you would reign That you would reign in us We're offering up our lives A living sacrifice that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We cry out for your life to refine us. Cry out for your love to refine us. Cry out for your mercy to keep us. Blameless until you return Oh great and mighty one With wonders I will come That you would reign That you would reign in us We're offering up our lives a living sacrifice that you would reign, that you would reign in us. Oh, great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. Oh, offering up our lives, a living sacrifice. That you would reign, that you would reign in us. Crown him with me.
His glory is now we sing Who died and rose on high Who died eternal life to bring And lives that death may die Calvary kids. Thanks for joining us for week three of our Bible art series. Let's do a quick review. Here's what you might have missed. The first week we talked about clay. With clay and a little imagination, we can mold a great many things. We learned that God created the universe and everything in it in just six days from Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 27. Last week we talked about finger painting. Finger painting gets really messy, but that's half the fun in creating wonderful artwork. We learned that when we let God into our messy situations, He can turn them into something wonderful. We read from Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 to 23, about Daniel in the lion's den. Art doesn't have to be fancy to be great. Of course, this isn't going to surprise you if you're a kid. Kids know that it doesn't have to be a fancy art painting or a beautiful stone sculpture to be great art. Kids can turn just about anything into a piece of art. From a piece of wood to cardboard from a cereal box, maybe it's an empty pop can, whatever it is, you know that can be turned into something really, really awesome. Let's not forget what we're talking about today, popsicle sticks. Popsicle sticks can be made into some amazing pieces of art. You can do two-dimensional pieces of art, you could create the front of a house, or you could create a dog or a cat. Now, I wanna show you a couple pictures. These are not from me, I took these off of Pinterest, but check out these works of art. Do you think you could make something like this? You can build anything you can dream up of with popsicle sticks, but as with any structure, you need to give your art a firm foundation if you want it to last. No sculptures can last for centuries without a firm foundation. No building can stand without a firm foundation. Jesus told his followers that their lives needed to have a firm foundation. And he also told us where to find that foundation. If we want to build faith that will last, we need to build our faith on the word of God. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. This is the end of what's called the Sermon of the Mount that he preached. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand.
and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. God wants us to have a strong faith, one that can stand up to the storms of life. He knows we need a firm foundation, and so that's why he gave us one, the Word of God, the Bible. It's a love letter to the earth, a message from our Creator that we are loved. And when we build our life on the Word of God, we will have a foundation that can weather any storm. Life is full of all sorts of storms. There are literal storms with wind and rain and lightning and floods. And then there's figurative storms. Some storms come in the form of bad news. Some storms come in the form of misfortune. Whether the storm in your life is rain and wind or whether it's illness and tragedy, it can be a real test of your faith. But when we build our lives on the Word of God, we will be prepared for those storms. We won't have our faith shaken by injury or illness or by bad news because we know we have a loving God who is watching out for us. God doesn't always prevent bad things from happening, partially because that can help us build our faith and it can help us grow stronger and closer to God. But He will always help us to weather the storms and to come out stronger. So, how do we build our lives on the Word of God? By learning what the Bible has to say. That's why every week when you come to church or when you watch church online, we read from the Bible. We want to share the good news of the Bible with you in a way that helps you to remember what it has to say. We can deepen our foundation even more by reading the Bible at home. The Bible is not just for when we're at church. If we read the Bible every day, then we'll get to know the Word of God in a deeper and deeper way. And when we start to memorize Bible verses, we'll have the Word of God in our minds and our hearts at all times, making our foundation even stronger. Have you seen our um, memory verse challenge? We as Calvary kids and as families are memorizing Psalm chapter 8 together. If you haven't started yet, it's not too late. Get in on our memory verse challenge and put the Word of God in your mind and in your heart. God knows that the storms of life are coming and He wants us to be prepared. We can prepare ourselves by studying the Word of God. Don't be knocked down by the wind and the storms that are coming. Trust in God and stand firm on the promises that He gives us in His Word. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Naomi. I would love it if you would take your Bibles where you are at home. And we're going to have two different readings this morning before we come to the sermon. So please take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, that's going to be our first reading this morning. I'm going to be reading Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 to 26. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 to 26. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26. This is the word of God. Paul writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. 
And then our second reading this morning, flip over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, James. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. So uh, our second reading is 2 Timothy 2. And what I would love to do is to read to you verses 22 to 26. 2 Timothy 2, verses 22 to 26. I hope you're there in your Bibles. I hope you will follow along. Keep a thumb in Galatians 5, 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26. Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is the word of God. Well, I hope you're back in Galatians 5 in your Bibles. We're in our last uh, Sunday of this brief little series, this three-part series on when Christians disagree, when, when we disagree. And uh, I don't know about you, I find it very, very reassuring to know uh, what the Bible says about these different things. So let's pray, uh, let's get to work, and see what else the Lord has to challenge us on as we walk with Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, You are our God, and we thank You that You are so patient with us as Your children. It truly is a model for those of us who are parents ourselves. And so as you often see your children squabbling amongst each other, I pray that you would apply the balm and challenge of your word, the reassurance of your word to our lives, to our hearts, to our minds, that we, we would hear and know your will on these matters. Father, forgive us. When we have gone too far, <clears throat> forgive us when we have been so right that we are wrong. Grace has been missing. The truth has been devoid of grace. And Father, forgive us when we have been too gracious, when we really should have said something, but we didn't. That's love without truth, grace without truth. We, we need them both, grace and truth together. And so I pray as we look at this subject just one last time, I pray, O oh God, that again, our hearts and minds would be ready, not sitting critical, but Father, ready to receive, open, teachable, and Father, prepped by the ministry of your Holy Spirit to not just ready ourselves, but Father, also to understand. And we will give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've said, we're in week three of our little mini-series in January. We'll be into Acts again next week. But I hope it's been a real help to you. It's been a challenge and a, and a help to me as I've looked at this particular topic of when we disagree. We Christians don't always find it easy to live and to work with each other. And I suspect we don't cherish our unity as much as we should do. Well, the apostle is writing with just those thoughts in mind, only he's not penning a letter here to several different denominations, but rather to one and the same local church in our first reading in Galatia. 
In fact, it's quite striking and biting when you actually go and you look at the verse just before our reading this morning. Our reading started at verse 16, but look at verse 15. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. Well, mercifully, we've been spared most of that at Calvary, but we need to stay alert, especially if you or I have a tendency to reach for the cutting put down or the sharpened claws. And if we tend to take our unity for granted, notice what's tucked in the middle of the acts of the selfish nature in verses 19 to 21. Sandwiched in between idolatry and sorcery or witchcraft on the one hand and drunkenness and orgies on the other hand, we see right in the middle dissensions and divisions. I mean, we'd hardly mention all of those different things in the same breath. And yet that is what comes here this morning in our passage from Galatians 5. It's truly remarkable. And then we come to the fruit of the Spirit. We round off this series and when we disagree, and as we do that, My prayer is that we'd show this fruit in our dealings with one another. The fruit of the Spirit. That we would show one another love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So much could be said about each one of those different uh, facets of the fruit of the Spirit But for our time this morning together, I want to focus on really the the first quality and and, and the last quality, the, the bookends, if you like, which guard them all, namely love and self control. Love and self control. Please come with me now to our second passage this morning, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Why are we going there? Well, because I believe 2 Timothy 2 is an illustration and the outworking of Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to see love and self-control here illustrated in this we paragraph. 2 Timothy 2. Let's begin with firstly, love. Love. You see, when we disagree, love the person more than the argument. Love the person more than the argument. Please understand, when we disagree, it's so much more than just being a truth issue. It's more than a who's right, who's wrong affair. In fact, to be honest with you, as I've prayed previously, you can be so right that you're wrong. You can be so angrily right or pointedly right, so roughly right that you're wrong. You've lacked grace. There are some issues that some have a lot at stake in their worth, their identity, their loyalty to Christ and the Bible can all be bound up in it. It may be misguided but it's still very real and the scope for damage is huge i was chatting with a brother the other day and i mentioned to him that i knew someone who'd been converted because of the evidence for a six-day creation it had convinced him now to question that that pillar of his newfound faith would have wouldn't have been just raising a question about how you interpret a certain type of biblical literature. Rather, it would have been to threaten his whole faith. We're to love the person more than the argument. There's more to disagreement than just cool, dispassionate logic and certainly more than point scoring and person defaming and person destroying debate. 
Actually, let me go further. When we're in a disagreement, we're looking to win the person more than the argument. In this paragraph of ours in 2 Timothy 2, there seems to be a range of disagreements going on. Did you see that? From the foolish and ignorant controversies of verse 23 to the errors that lead people into the snare of the devil in verse 26. And all along, the thrust is not that Timothy would appear to be this impressive pastor taking on all comers. But so often we don't get beyond that. And particularly when there's a sense of threat. And there's a sense of threat here, isn't there? Verse 25, correcting his opponents. And publicly, I take it by times in the church, maybe in a small group, around the dining room table, where there's a sense of threat, we very quickly abandon love. When it's our standing, our status, our reputation, our face that needs saving, we'll win the argument at all costs. We just go straight to the nuclear option. The apostle wants to win the person. Do you see that? Do you see what he says in verse 25? Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Now notice, 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 notice. I did say love the person more than the argument. I did not say love the person more than the truth. I didn't say that. Because when you say something like that, love the person more than the argument, it tends to lead to a silence. Why? Well, we want to win the person so much, we don't want to offend. Offense is the cardinal sin of today. At the risk of not being loving, we simply choose to say nothing. We dodge the issue. But this can, this can result in letting folks continue to think wrongly, to speak wrongly, to live sinfully and all without love's warning. This series on when we disagree was not meant to lead uh, people to end up saying, well, you know, disagreement happens, it doesn't really matter. No, it's meant to make us realize that it happens, so here's how we should handle it. Namely, with a love that cares enough for a person so that we will disagree if we think that they're wrong. But as those who've learned how love disagrees. And one more thing about love that's striking in this little paragraph in 2 Timothy. We are to love all the Lord's people, not just the in crowd. Those who you happen to click with the most, those who you surround yourself with, who agree with you. Love instinctively seeks others to draw alongside and for too many of us, our love falls short of this loving all God's people. We don't cherish our unity as we should. Watch how the paragraph begins in verse 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. You know, we're not to argue for argument's sake, but watch how he goes on. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Folks, you have to waste time. You have to waste time if you love unity. You can't just talk about all the ways certain people have it wrong. You have to love unity as you do it. You have to waste time if you're a, a driven person and your drivenness does not include along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You have to waste time if you're just focused on getting the job done because, and we might as well come clean, it's almost always quicker to get the job done if it's just me or you and my crowd or your crowd. But we're to be family with the Lord's People, not just my crowd, not just your crowd, to pursue peace along with people who 
don't nest, who dot my I's and cross my T's. No, along with those who call on the Lord also out of a pure heart. Let me give you an example of this. Going not just from our, 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 our friendship group at church, but to a wider denominational look. Here's one place where I really struggle. I want to be very honest with you. Here's one place where I really struggle as a, a pastor of, of this church, Calvary Baptist Church, which is a member of the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches of Canada. We as a Fellowship Baptist Church hold to the position that you have to be baptized by immersion to become a member of our church family. Now, I hold to that position, but at the same time, I do wrestle with that. Why? Because I know many other brothers and sisters in Christ, some of whom attend our church, who have not been immersed as believers, and so they cannot become members. In fact, let me broaden that. There are many wonderful authors that I read, read, and some of whom I have met, like Christopher Ashe and, 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 and Kevin DeYoung and John Stott, Rico Tice, Sam Albury, Philip Riken, Ligon Duncan, who cannot become members of our church because they have not been baptized as a believer. And these are good guys. Their writings are very worth reading. And so whilst I hold my position, I really struggle with it. I love you all very much, but my love for the Lord's people goes wider than this church. The disagreement, the disagreement comes. Now, does love come across my mental radar screen or is it just wind or duck beneath the parapet? If love is to feature, if the fruit of the Spirit is to shape my attitudes and my response in a disagreement, then something else must appear as well. Not just love, but secondly this morning, self-control. That other bookend. Love and self-control. You see, self-control is the other side of the same coin as love. I cannot love others if I am so full of love for myself. I can't love others and give myself to them if my selfish instincts and attitudes are not under control. So again, watch the apostle work them out in this paragraph in 2 Timothy 2. He speaks of, for, uh, first little sub-point there, the self-control to flee. Think about it. There are some things that take self-control to run away from. He mentions them in verse 22. So flee, run away from youthful passions. And I don't believe that he's got in mind here casual sex, excessive drinking, and just general boisterousness and disobedience. It's referring more to the impatience and the hot-headedness of youth. He's not saying show no passion. It's more flee the passion that can't stop. And you don't have to be Timothy's age, and he was young, to need this warning. You don't need to be young. In fact, maybe some of you are sitting there and you're advanced in years and you're thinking, hey, I'm not as old as I once thought. And you don't need to be a pastor either to know something of the pain of leadership that he faced. I mean, opposition, who wants it? Can't you see I'm right, Pastor? For example, a truth that you believe is vital, but the rest of the church family is happy to sort of fudge along with a general consensus over, that's a painful tension for you. Or the disagreement, which means your stand leaves people whispering about you or passive-aggressively Facebook posting about you, and which so often turns into character assassinating you or slandering you. And where there's pain, there's the temptation to hit back, to score points, to show your authority for love to disappear from the radar screens. Flee youthful passions, he says. 
And it's youthful passion above all that gets you sucked into the kind of arguments that are not worth touching. That's what he's on about in verse 23. Look with me in your copy of the scripture. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Quarrel here means disagreement without self-control. An issue where those involved can't control their perspective. You know the sort of thing. Theological hobby horses where theological mountains are made out of molehills. A side issue becomes an all-defining one where the passions get personal, where people turn into keyboard warriors. These quarrels lead to, as verse 24 infers, leads to unkindness and even to resentment. And those things leave me unfit for the one thing I must be equipped for as a servant of the Lord. Verse 24, able to teach. And that goes for you too, not just for the pastor. It goes for you too. We are all servants of the Lord. You see, if I'm too busy hitting back, I will never, verse 25, gently correct. I will never, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2, be able to correct and rebuke and exhort with great patience and with careful instruction. It takes self-control. It takes self-control to run away, to flee from those arguments. Canadian New Testament scholar Don Carson has written a little book called Memoirs of an Ordinary Pastor. Truthfully, out of all the books that he has written, this is my favorite book of his. And it's the story of his dad, Tom Carson. And Tom was a church planter in Quebec with the fellowship back in the, I want to say, 40s, 50s, 60s, somewhere in and around there. He was involved at one stage of his ministry in a disagreement that turned into a division and had a lot of sourness come out of it. But Don never heard anything about it until he himself went to seminary and someone told him the story there in one of his Baptist church history classes, would you believe? He goes back home one weekend and he says to his dad, Dad, how come you never told us kids any of this? And his dad, Tom, replied after a long pause. There were two reasons. First, you were children of the manse, and although you'd seen the outworking of the gospel, you've also seen more than your fair share of difficult and ugly things. We didn't think it was wise to expose you to this history when you were young. And secondly, your mum and I decided we needed to protect our own souls from bitterness, so we took a vow that neither of us would say an unkind thing about the minister who led the opposition, and we've kept our vow. Now that is spirit-led, spirit-enabled self-control to flee, to keep out of arguments that aren't worth entering, or I'm not in a fit state to enter. You know, I'm hurt. I'm too angry. I'm too emotional. It takes the God's Holy Spirit to kind of pull me clear. And please don't think that this is just the verbal face-to-face. That's what that means. We live in an age where we have email and we have Facebook and we have Twitter and messages sent without self-control are a menace. They're written and sent without reference to the damage they can cause to a live human being on the other end of them just because they can't see that person. I have seen some dreadful appalling emails sent by professing Christians in love as if that little tag at the end makes it all better. Some of the best advice I was ever given about emails was this or about communications with this. If something comes in and you feel you've got to answer back, write the email. Then save it. Put it in your drafts folder in your email package. 
go home, go to sleep, get up the next day, reread the email that you've written, delete it, and then write the real one. That's good advice right there. Gently, patiently, carefully instruct. Actually, when you think back to the gospel stories, isn't Jesus just remarkable with the disciples? Go back and read those gospels again. There are, there are by times, they, they're, they're, they're just they're so slow, they're so dense. So we say back in the UK, they're so thick. Yet he patiently goes on explaining, don't you see, don't you understand, have I not been with you so long and you still don't get it, guys? Sure, with proud Pharisees, Jesus' canon was very sharp. With the willfully disobedient like Herod, he would just be silent. But I don't have Jesus' insight, and I suspect that you don't have either. I find it wiser to just begin with, brother or sister, I think you've got it wrong here. Can you show me where you get that from, from your Bible? Let them spend some time explaining why they've landed where, they're, where they've landed so I can see where they are and why they're there. Never mind the possibility that they may reveal that possibly I'm the one in the wrong. But again, I go back to my previous point. Sometimes that involves time. And sometimes it's time that we don't want to give and we might have to waste some time. Doing it, but is it really a waste of time? No. Or take the three principles that we saw last week. Do you remember them? Principles to bring into any disagreement the test of listening, the test of scripture, and the test of grace. We need self control to live those three things, yes? We need self-control to listen to others. Look, if you're gagging to answer back, doesn't it take self-control to listen? There are times when I can hardly wait for the person to finish the sentence. One guy I've heard of used to make a habit in that before he responded to a question, he himself would ask a number of questions of his own before he answered. What exactly did you mean by this? When you said that, what particular scenario were you thinking of? Why did he do that? Well, because he wanted to get to the question behind the question, not what was perhaps first asked. And then he applied the same principles to disagreements. He wrote this. My main response, he says, lies in the area of polarization. It may be that I am suffering from a hardening of the arteries. It may be that I'm suffering from the kind of theological and moral compromise which are associated with senility. But, and you know, now's the bit that you've got to listen to closely. But, In theological debate, I think it's important not to push people to the opposite extreme to the one we occupy ourselves, unless the facts warrant it. And it's also important for us to confess our own tendencies to imbalance. Yeah. And it takes self-control to do all of that. And it takes self-control not just to listen to others, but also to listen to Scripture. We want to be those who sit under God's Word. But the heat of disagreement so often drives us out from under it. Even when we profess to defend it. We start to build theological castles in the sky. We start to theologize in different directions. And we get very heated about it all. And youthful passions want to get results, want to champion the cause, want to produce the slam dunk answer. 
without self-control, we can get carried away so that we don't listen properly even to what God is saying in his word. Self-control to listen to others, self-control to listen to the scripture, and then self-control to listen to grace. Because in the heat of a disagreement, it can be hard to hear grace's wisdom. In other words, you can be right about something, but you're doing it in the wrong way. You're being too harsh. You're too, being too forceful. You're being too pushy. You're being too nasty. In fact, as I've said previously, you're so right, you're wrong. Let me finish up this morning with two examples, one personal and one example from church history. It was during the spring of last year that I preached through four chapters of the book of Revelation, Revelation 4, 5, 6, and 7. And I looked at those chapters as it pertained to our situation at that time, really at the very beginning, at the very start of the pandemic. Revelation is a book that helps us understand how to live life on the edge. It's all about discipleship, not newspaper clipping sensationalism. As a result of what I preached, a brother in Christ called me up that Sunday afternoon and had loads of questions. And I was happy to take that call and happy to have that conversation, which helped him clarify in his mind where I was coming from and how I understood the book. Although in truth, I want to be right up front, I'm still learning. During the call, we disagreed. We went back and forth, listening to each other, learning from one another, asking good questions, correcting one another. It was a good conversation. And by the end of the call, we still disagreed. But at the end of the call, we prayed together on the phone. And I loved that. At the end of what could have been and could have turned into a fractious conversation, two brothers in Christ were calm enough, loving enough toward one another, even though they disagreed, to pray together. Could I offer that as a litmus test to you all this morning? At the end of a debate or a disagreement, are you calm enough? Do you have your stuff together enough to pray together? If not, perhaps there's more work to do before you do. Because at the end of debates, it's always good to pray together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ after all. And then my second example, and this is where I will close. I want you to come with me back to the 17th century. There were two great evangelists that preached on both sides of the big spit, both sides of the Atlantic. And they were George Whitfield and they were John Wesley. God used both both of them, to bring about an extraordinary awakening, a great revival. But they were so different from one another theologically. In fact, they fell out with one another over the doctrine of free will. The disagreement was serious, it was lifelong, and it split and divided many of their followers. And one day, one of Whitfield's followers asked him, do you think, Mr. Whitfield, that we will see Mr. Wesley in heaven? No, came the reply, I very much doubt it. A smug look of triumph spread across the face of Whitfield's follower, clearly delighted with what he was hearing. But George Whitfield went on, Mr. Wesley will be so near the throne of God and we will be so far away, I very much doubt whether we'll see him at all. You see, to, to disagree on, on such a serious issue, to do it passionately, to do it fiercely, and still to speak so graciously. Oh, for the self-control to hear and speak words of grace like that. What would, you, what would that bring to our disagreements? What would that bring to our disagreements if we brought that grace 
And yet the more you think about it, the more you think, who is sufficient for these things? Who of us is up to it? Well, God's Holy Spirit has not left us alone. God has not left us alone. When Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, he sent us his Spirit to enable us to disagree agreeably, to protect our testimonies so that we understand that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ died for us all, regardless of some of the opinions that we might hold to. If we hold to those central core tenets, if we believe that Christ died for our sins, if we believe that we have had that great exchange where Christ's righteousness has been given to us and he on the cross took our unrighteousness and paid that penalty before a living God so that we could be reconciled to him by faith and through this resurrection from the grave, we can be assured of eternal life. If that is our ground zero, we can disagree agreeably. We can debate and we can talk. We don't have to argue and scrap and fight and separate and all of these different things. You wonder why there's so many denominations? Probably all because of personality clashes and, and just power hungriness. Brothers and sisters, I hope that these things have been a great challenge to you and an encouragement to you. And so what I want to do just as we close together is I want us to pray. Let's pray together that these things would be so in our lives, here at Calvary and beyond. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that prayer is so much more effective than just despair. And so we ask that you would pour out your Spirit on us, we pray. Grow your fruit in our lives so that even when we disagree, your love, your self-control can be clearly seen in how we interact and live with one another. How we bear with one another. How we love one another. Thank you for the unity you give us in Christ here at Calvary. And we ask that that you would guard that in our church family, we pray. For the fame of Jesus' name and for the sake of the propagation of the gospel. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to remind you of two things that are upcoming. Firstly, we will have our business meeting tomorrow night uh, on Zoom. So uh, again, please click on that link and you will be able to come in and be a part of that. The, the link will be uh, on our website. You can, you can certainly find it there. It will be on Facebook. Please come and be a part of that. It's our first ever virtual business meeting. Again, we break new ground here at Calvary with a virtual business meeting. We want to be able to uh, vote our budget into place and to start to operate uh, with the congregation's approval here at Calvary. And secondly, I also want to say to you that the coldest night of the year will still be happening this year. And what's going to be happening is we're going to be putting information for you, for your family, to be able to participate in that. It probably won't look like what it has done in the past, but we'll still be able to do it. Coldest night of the year, it's coming up towards the end of February. I'm mentioning it now so that indeed if you have any questions, you can call Pastor Paul, you can call Jeffrey Orman, and uh, those guys are going to be heading that up. And again, what can we do? 
for uh, those who are on the edge of things here in our town, in our valley here in, in, uh, in this beautiful part of the world. Monies will be going to the grind. The grind are going to have to leave where they are, downtown Pembroke. They're going to have to move up to the old fire hall just behind Victoria Hall, uh, just up above the, the RBC. And so they're going to have to operate really quickly and get the, uh, the renovations done to that fire hall. So that's what we're going to be walking for. That's what we're raising money for. And so again, I just want to drop that seed right now. And uh, again, ask, what, what is it? What, what is it can we do? As, in, as an individual, as a family, perhaps a family unit, uh, to again, take care and love uh, those who... Uh, don't have. How can the gospel be good news to the poor? Well, that's one way. That's one way. You scratch the veneer off the top of the grind and you will very quickly find the Christian faith. Okay? That's all I want to say. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Have a great week. God bless you, Rich. Signing off for now.